Good day, fellow adventurers. Thank you for being punctual. You're right on time as usual. Glad to have you back. How was your week? Come on in. Take your hats off. Stay a while. Clothing optional. Welcome to Dresden's Tale, episode 53. This is season 3, volume 3. The prologue of this volume in our spectacular tale. Some people think I'm a little weird, but I love pounding square pegs into round holes. Only sure bet for my listeners is non-traditional storytelling. This is high military fantasy, the kind that needs heroes. Ours is Dresden Fane, a dwarf, a warlock, a lover, and a fighter. He's a warrior of the Stone Clan, merrily making his way across the turbulent backdrop of questionable ethics. I'm Lewis Nichols, your overheated narrator, sweaty and ready for a fresh bowl of ice cream. I'm the guy who wrote this thing, a crazy project spanning two decades and a whole cartload of Word documents. Thanks to YouTube, I now have a reasonable way to pass it on to you. When we last left our hero, he had won the day, successfully defending the Campbell city of Fort Roth on Vool. That first part being the clan, the last part being the plane. To be fair, he had a little help. I'm not even sure the great powers of the city knew he was there. We did, though, and that's what matters. All right, so why a prologue as a second installment? It's not Ziblich, people. We have traditions to follow, and one is to honor Dresden's love of the theater. Keep your voices down, find your seats, and let's see what's playing. By an uncanny coincidence, it is Heloy's High Holy Day, Ebba's 24th, 2052 years after the fall. Tribulations 665 If a beginning can be said to exist at all, you best believe there was something that led up to it. Dresden learned three things in three days. The first, Fort Roth was defensible, but more of a town than a fortification. Low walls, scattered towers, and ditches were the Campbell Settlement's salvation. Apparently, there was an engineer in town who loved to build squat stone towers. Meanwhile, his partner Jin made it his life's work to populate them with crank-driven, oversized crossbows. It had been enough. Thirty hours after Dresden came through the gates, the city was declared safe. In celebration, he took a nap. When he woke up, he found warriors were being called to action for two primary purposes. Many went out to battle the Iterians. According to Campbell Intelligence, a number of local villages were still occupied. It would take time to drive the threat back if it could be accomplished at all. However, no Campbell commander would take on Dresden or Liz, at least until they could get letters of approval signed off by town officials, who did not have time for them. That left digging, or other menial labors meant to see to the repairs and improvements, just in case that first group failed. Liz dug for a few hours, but got picked up by a human who thought she was tough enough, or pretty enough, to serve on his private guard. From what she could tell Dresden, the man was some kind of researcher, and she was only a little relieved he hadn't recruited her for more personal matters. Being a Campbell, looking at her all day, was apparently as lusty as it got. Dresden didn't even dig for a few hours. He'd learned all too well he had a valuable skill that would keep him out of such work. Twice a day, he used the Magical Glyph to magically transport troops to and from destinations around the oasis. He gambled it wouldn't become permanent duty. All he needed was to transport one commander willing to take him on, and he'd be done. If not, a priest of the local temple of Sampha told him he was making his clan a hundred silver bits a day for the effort. The second thing Dresden learned about Vool was the astronomy, at least enough to know it was not a place kind to dwarves. 
What they called the sun was a boiling orange ball of fire half the size of Dresden's outstretched hand. Keto slowly plodded across the sky, giving the point a day almost three times as long as the one he was used to. That should have meant long dark nights to go with them, but it didn't. Heliot, a bright red blur ten times the size of Keto, crossed the sky like a cloud, but in the opposite direction. Its brisk pace sent it across the sky five times for every one of Keto's crossings. Then there was Nava, a bright white spot to the south that didn't move at all. The last thing Dresden learned was much more pleasant. Jetstar Livingston lived in Fort Roth. The elven quester bard was one of the founders of the Campbell clan. He was an adventuring partner to Campbell himself back during the quest to find the 101 magical stones and restore the god's faith in humanity. He was one of the most powerful priests of Haloi currently alive. Under his patronage, Fort Roth had an amphitheater suited for a much larger city. In peaceful times, it was not unusual for many hundreds to pass over from Camberg to see the shows. Today, it only served as entertainment for the warriors. Dresden let out a boo when Pope Ursa, or rather the actor playing him, came into view. He instantly clamped his mouth shut. Ursa wasn't supposed to be the bad guy of the play. Dresden just didn't like popes. Ursa took to the stage and began his monologue. Be ever watchful. The actor spoke with exaggerated gestures. We cannot know the hearts of our neighbors, but we can see his action. Watch for the slow movement of the dull. Listen for the doleful drone of the willing victim. Act when the seditious by inaction threatens our city, our faith, and our hearts. As the play began in earnest, Dresden looked around at the dwarves sitting near him. They hadn't gathered on purpose. Dresden chose his spot because it was open. When a dwarven couple set a row behind him, he assumed they had done the same. Then he noticed several warriors, not dwarves, get up and move away. He was angry until he realized why. He sniffed. Only a portion of the stench was his own. Well, Dresden grunted. He didn't care. They could all fuck off for all he cared. He had fought for days, even managed to find a scuffle on one of his pocket space runs. He laughed a little, realizing a red-eyed elf he'd transported didn't have sand in his eyes. He had Dresden's stink up his nose. A dwarf in front of him heard and turned back, giving him a crooked smile. The older Tarek sniffed and laughed himself. Dresden nodded, but noticed the warrior's hat. It was wide-brimmed, with a mesh hanging down to further protect from the glare. The plate-clad dwarf pulled off the hat and twisted it in the air, displaying it for Dresden. Pudges, blue tarped stall in the market. Both dwarves realized they were probably being a little too loud and turned back to the action. Not that Forever Watchful was particularly action-packed. The long tail was about a man who initially seemed likable enough but turned out to be the bad guy. Hazelstock had two defining factors. For one, he never called anybody by their name. Roger would be Rod, Roger Podger, or Rog Rog. That, of course, was for humorous effect. The more important trait was that Hazelstock always avoided work. Dresden was familiar with the play. He'd once seen a shorter version in Parncilia. Sometimes, when there was extra paper around the city, people would make up flyers with an image of the character calling somebody else by funny alterations of their name. When Dresden heard the show was playing, he couldn't stay away. This was a special High Holy Day rendition, a -a once-in-a-lifetime chance. Six hours, the full, nuanced version of the story. It was something only an elf could write and a dwarf properly appreciate. He settled in for the full experience of the hero turning villain. When it was done, his head swam with the signs to look for. He thought he might have known a few layabouts himself, 
all the worst kind of clansmen. The chief would always provide, but some of those who received his bounty were unworthy. It was a warrior's responsibility to show the lazy their sins, and to correct them no matter how harsh the remedy might be. The siege is foretold, a minotaur yelled at the crowd outside the theater. Brave Rock stands a fist in defiance to the heretic. A fist up the ass. That's how one stoner says good morning to the next, a heckler called out. A minor kerfuffle ensued when an outnumbered warrior of the stone clan pushed back. Dresden stepped forward, but the fight was already broken up. The minotaur continued undeterred. I see what you have not. The whole future of the Stone Clan laid out before me by the Dozen Lord himself. Right from the first steps of Einfar, as he first left the city of Patronsburg. Right up to the end of time, when the unforgiving light washes us from this land and all others. What a pile of lizard shit, Dresden muttered. He'd have said it louder, but the man was Stone Clan, and they had to stick together, at least in part. The city was starting to become familiar, yet Dresden hesitated. He was trying to remember where he'd seen a bath. The play opened his eyes to the idea that filth might be his own trick of laziness. A non teric was never going to pick him up in a fighting team while he smelled so bad. Exile Praetor! That's the word, so shut your yap! Shut up! Dresden looked back as the guard rammed the hilt of his sword into the prophet's guts. A part of him wanted to defend the fellow stoner. But if he thought he could see the future, the man was an idiot. If he would have come for a fight, the Campbells might have accepted him, as they might accept Dresden after he bathed. Yet another lesson. Never be the loud outsider. Did you ever watch Survivor? Is it still running? Either way, Dresden just learned rule number one. It's always the loud one who gets voted off first. Eventually, they all turn out to be a little nuts. But in the beginning, there's always that one guy or gal who just can't fake normal for even a day. Thank goodness it wasn't Dresden. After a bath, the Campbells might just decide he's an okay kind of warrior. What would we do if Dresden got voted off the island? Oh, that's a segue. Time to remind you just how much power you have. No, you can't talk me into getting rid of Dresden. But it's time to start planning a PR campaign for your favorite side characters. Odds are, if you're listening to this at or near release, I'm starting on Volume 4. That means you can be an influence. What side characters are you into? Who do you want to see gone for good? You probably won't get exactly what you like but I'll take just about anything under consideration. And just like that, here we are again. You should know what to do by now. Chant with me. Like, subscribe, share. Like, subscribe, share. Visit my fiction on Amazon for Kindle. While you're at it, have a great day. See you next time. Cheers.